before we talk about the war and the Holocaust, tell us a little about your life before the war, your family, your community, what it was like. Uh, I lived in a very small town, which was on the Russian border. Uh, Poland was a democracy at the time. Pilsudski had liberated the area and Poland became a democracy. We were on the border with Russia. The town was like four kilometers from the Russian border and there was a military installation there of the Polish army. Uh, life was very pleasant. As far as I remember, I had all the conveniences and lived in a household that had a lot of help. My, both my parents were in business. My mother had a fabric store and my father was supplying uh, the army garrison and also exporting to Germany. Um, life was good, and I started an early education. I had a nanny, or at that time they called them a governess, <laughs> that um, taught me to read and to speak Hebrew and, of course, Polish, and the native language there was Belarus. Um, I did not expect to be in the circumstances that eventually evolved. My father died in 1937 after a trip to the German border to deliver some goods. At that time, there were some Jews that were um, deported from Germany, Polish Jews that were considered non-citizens they came to better their lives in Germany because it was a much more um, progressive country and they were deported when the Hitler regime came into power. Uh, he went to visit them and got some sort of an infection, uh, could not find the re any medication for it, could not find any help for him, and he died. My mother took over both businesses and was very much engaged in the business. Needless to say, my upbringing was mostly by the help in the house. Mm -hmm. So was my brother's. My brother was three years younger, three or four years, between three and four years younger than I. The war broke out. Ray, one other question before we turn to the war. Um, your father, as you said, died when you were young. Do you have memories of him? Only the memory of the picture, and I remember certain incidents. I know he was tall because when he put me on his shoulders, I almost reached the chandelier and it was a high ceiling. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I remember that is because electricity was installed in the house, which wasn't very prevalent in that part of Poland. And uh, I remember that particular incident. Other than that, I remember very little of my father. Mm -hmm. And I was going to also ask you, um, tell us about the interactions between your family and other Jews with the Christian community in, in, uh, well, in Dog City. Both my parents were in business, so they had a lot of uh, contact with the farm population. Uh, the Far, the general population had to buy fabrics in order to make their clothes. They didn't go to a department store like you do now. And uh, mother not just uh, had a store, but she also distributed to smaller stores. She did kind of wholesaling mm -hmm. because she would buy the fabrics in bolts and needless to say, it was too much fabric for her store. So she would sell it to other stores. Uh, the farmers would come, and the general population from town would come to buy the fabrics. As far as I can remember, she was the only fabric store in the town and in the surrounding area. My father, again, had a lot of contact because he bought up produce, he bought up animals, he was involved in the slaughter of animals and providing the meat for the Polish army and uh, supply the meat also for the Jewish population. There was a quota. You could only slaughter so much for the Jewish population, which required a special way of slaughter. He got around it by having it all slaughtered the humane way, which we consider mm -hmm. 
the uh, way the Jews are required to slaughter an animal so it does not suffer. And uh, the town was very prosperous. Mm -hmm. There were between 2,500 and 3,000 Jews in the town and general population of the town was about 6,000. Um, I had a lot of interaction with the community outside because I, I remember taking matzah to the Greek Orthodox, um, well, he called him, we called him the batushka, I guess he would call him the priest. Mm -hmm. And he would give me honey. He was um, producing honey. And I remember decorating a Christmas tree with a family in the, an outlying village. <laughs> the ornaments that were made was to make a hole at the top of the egg and the bottom of the egg and blow out the contents and then paint a face on it, attach a hat with a string to hang on the Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. You so remember that. I remember that. Silly things I remember. Important things I'm not so sure. September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland, starting World War II. No, no. Russia invades Poland in no, 1939. No, no. September 1st, uh, Germany invades Poland, then Russia comes. Oh, yeah. Russia. And, my and part. I'm part. only concerned exactly. with Exactly. A couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yes, uh, there was an agreement between Germany and Russia, and so two weeks That's later, right. the Russians come in and occupy your town. What? They came in at night. Well, most of my memory from those things are my mother's description of things. The Russians came in at night. The tanks rolled in with, without any notice, former, no war declaration, no notice. Uh, Germany had declared war on Poland, mm -hmm. but our part, there was a which was a, a, a long distance from the German-Russian border, from the German-Polish border. The Russians just marched in at night and took over half of Poland. And that became an occupation that lasted for two years. So tell us what life was like under the Soviet occupation, under the Russians, during those first couple of years of the war. Uh, the Russian system believed that any anybody who was engaged in commerce uh, was not a suitable profession. Everything was owned by the state. My mother very quickly distributed the contents of the store to friendly farmers mm -hmm. that she had contact with, with the agreement that they would provide us with some food in exchange for the fabrics and to use whatever they needed. She also uh, hid some of even our clothing, her coats, our better coats, with the farmers for the simple reason because the Russians looted. The soldiers would come in. And one of the things that she always told about and left about is that she had some silk nightgowns. And the Russians had confiscated those. And some of their women were walk marching around with them in the street. Mm -hmm. Also, that I remember is that we had an alarm clock, which wasn't really small. It was like the small bends that I have seen here in this country. And a Russian soldier actually strapped it on his wrist. Like a, a watch. Like a, a watch. Giant watch, yeah. That was a big possession. It was called chassis. Mm -hmm. uh, we had watches. They were good size. They weren't tiny watches mm -hmm. that... Uh, my mother and my father wore, but those they had hidden, of they course. They had those hidden. And what, you were forced to go to Russian school once, once the Russians were in, right? I went to a Hebrew parochial school that my father started, and I actually was enrolled in that school at the age of three because they needed a certain amount of students. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Russians came in, of course, any of the parochial schools, whether they were Christian or Jewish, were closed and everybody had to attend the public school, mm -hmm. which was Russian indoctrination. That's the best way I can describe it. Mm -hmm. And as I told you, Bill, one of the achievements that I thought at the time was a big one. Anybody who did not belong to the Communist Party or had associated with them uh, was not allowed to reach well, there were certain requirements in order to get into the lowest branch of the communist hierarchy. 
and that was called the pioneer. And in order to become a pioneer, you, either your parents had to be socialist, communist, or you had to achieve a high grade in your marks in school. And like all kids, and I'm sure that I was no different than a lot of the kids here in the United States that wanted to belong to some sort of a group, I had to achieve to get that red kerchief with the hammer and sickle insignia that held it together. Mm -hmm. And I was so proud of it. And when I came home, of course, my mother said, oh boy. And because your family was considered, because you, they, they had businesses and were considered bourgeois, you were, your family was fearful that you would end up being sent to Siberia. Correct. Uh, many of the people, the wealthier people in town, they would come at night, just tell them to take whatever they can with them in hand, a bundle, and they would deport them to Siberia. Actually, it would have been a blessing had we been deported. Mm -hmm. My mother all had a backpack. Well, here you'd call it a backpack. At that time, it was a bag with, with things ready in case they came at night. Because she was a widow, I guess she was not one of the first ones to mm -hmm. be considered for depor deportation. And as you, as you said a moment ago, later would, you, you would have wished you had been sent we to We wished we would, have been, we would have had a better chance for survival, the whole family. So speaking of that, in, in June 1941, Germany turned on the Soviets and quickly conquered all the territory that the Russians had in Poland. They, and the German army entered your town in the late summer of 1941. By the end of 1941, the Germans forced you and the other Jews in Dokshitsi into a ghetto. Tell us what you recall about that. What I recall is the first thing that happened was that we had to wear insignia. I'm sure many of you have heard of the yellow star. Um, we had to wear it on the clothing front, on the left front, right re back, on inner and outer garments. Uh, needless to say, it was considered for, for a kid, it was a a badge of shame. Um, also, we were not allowed to, if anybody walked on the sidewalk, we had to step off. And considering that in the part of the country that I lived, uh, snow started to fall in October and stayed on the ground until Easter. Uh, the the, there was no motor communication. The communication was by horse and buggy mm -hmm. or horseback. Needless to say, the streets weren't very clean. And when one was pushed off into the street, I hate to tell you what I came home smelling like. Mm -hmm. And that was a badge of shame. And of course, felt much, much depressed. Uh, before the winter set in, the Jews were all uh, collected into a ghetto. Uh, the ghetto was not what you consider here a ghetto, which has a certain segment of the population living, and it's called a ghetto because it's kind of inhabited by, by a group associated with each other, sort of. The ghetto was like a prison. Uh, one side of the ghetto, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have the picture. We, no? we, we aren't able to show it here. Okay, yes. that's okay. Uh, one side of the ghetto was a river. One side of the ghetto was the main street, and actually our house kept, fell into the ghetto because the houses on that street all had gates that closed the yards, mm -hmm. sort of blocked off from the street, and the rest of it was fenced. There were guards around it. Uh, people were not allowed to go out and in at leisure. Uh, they were only allowed out when uh, Germans took people to do some labor for them, or during market day, which the farmers could come to the, a certain gate in the ghetto to barter food with the ghetto inhabitants. Uh, also, the first thing that they did was they had everybody come to an open area and counted the population. Mm -hmm. 
everything was accounted for. Uh, the ghetto, they appointed the Jews even during uh, non-occupation times, had what they called a committee, a council, mm -hmm. that uh, was working with the Jewish population there for charities, for um, people that needed help, uh, interceding between people and with the government, and they appointed those people to intercede with the Nazi mm -hmm. government. Those people were supposed to uh, supply the Nazis with, first they wanted gold and silver. They called it all for the, for the benefit of the German armies to conquer Russia. Mm -hmm. That was the... That was the line. That was the line. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, a lot of it ended up in their own pockets. Uh, silver, gold, it was like a ransom. Every so often they required a supply of certain things. It also came down not just to gold and silver and money, it came down to utensils of brass and copper and even iron, and that all was for the war effort. People were so taking- So literally pots and pans? Were pots and pans, yeah. pots and pans. Anything that they consider a value actually. Right. Uh, the population was used as forced labor. Uh, the German army was stationed in the barracks where the Polish army had before, and uh, the German armies were more motorized than the Polish armies were, so they needed work on cleaning the stables, uh, doing their laundry, doing their cooking, uh, whatever menial jobs they had, mm -hmm. and also for road work. Mm -hmm. So they would take a number of people out in the morning, bring them back at night. Everybody was counted, and the population had to report back in the same number that they left. Mm -hmm. At one time, a few younger people had managed to escape and the count was not full. They brought the committee out and asked them to present those two people. Of course, they couldn't because they had escaped. Mm -hmm. The retribution was 10 for one. They would not allow that committee to offer themselves as hostages. Some of the people, some old men came out and said their life wasn't worth much anyway and they're willing to be counted as the hostages, but that was not acceptable to them. What they wanted is for that committee to select 10 for each, 20 people in all, young men of the same age, of the same health, mm -hmm. to be presented to the Nazis. That was a very difficult task for them. How do you give somebody up? Mm -hmm. They took those people and they shot them in front of the whole population of the ghetto. They just gunned them down. Needless to say, a lot of people considered escape as a sentence of death to others. And so very few have tried to escape. A few of them managed to escape though, but not many. Ray, you said that it, wouldn't, it wasn't long after the German occupation that in your words, they started diminishing the ghetto. Yes, within several months, uh, under the disguise of resettlement, they said they were going to take the Jews to a larger ghetto so that they would have consolidation. And at first, they asked everybody to come to the, mar to the area, the open area, and they selected people. They selected a lot of young ones, a lot of children, and some older people too. A mixture. But they did not take them to any larger ghetto. They took them to a pit and gunned them down. Word came back about it. People started to build hiding places, a plan for hiding places. So the second time around, there were not so many people that came out to the 
area when they called for resettlement the second time. So they basically went house to house and pulled people out. Those that had hiding places, of course, hid. Uh, our family house and warehouse were L-shaped, and between the warehouse and the family house, there was a space between the walls. From what my mother told me, it was used as basically a safe. We didn't have iron safes, but this was a hiding place, a hiding for, place valuables. for valuables, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. For any accounting books and so forth, things that they needed in the business. Mm -hmm. And it was covered with, by the same roof, so it was a continuation of roof. It didn't look like two separate buildings. And there was access to an attic to that area, and that became the hiding place. So when word spread and when it was, became obvious that they were, again, looking for people supposedly to resettle, uh, we went into that hiding place. Eventually, almost this time of the year, mm -hmm. it was after Passover, mm -hmm. that the ghetto was shrunken to such a point where we knew that was the last thing. Mm -hmm. And mother tried to find places, ways to actually get out before, but it was impossible. We, the final closing of the ghetto, we climbed into that hiding place. There were food provisions and water provisions there, very little sanitation available. We climbed into that place and we were hiding there. And who was with you? Tell us who was with you in that hiding place. My mother took, of course, me and my brother in. I know my grandmother was there, and there were some other people. I don't remember but who or what. But your grandmother was with you. My grandmother was one with us and basically saved us eventually. But we hid in that place. From what my mother told me, we were there between eight and 10 days. Uh, conditions became horrible, and we had to, some of the people couldn't stand it anymore. If you're enclosed with no light, the only thing you could hear it what was going on outside because the houses were not built of, not too many with much brick, it was mostly wood. Mm -hmm. So sound penetrated. You couldn't even speak loud. You had to speak in whispers. Some of the people just couldn't stand it anymore and came, went out. They were caught, but they never disclosed who else was hiding. At the end, from what my mother told us, well, I know my mother, my brother, and I, and my grandmother were there. There were several other people. We climbed out. My mother was first, and of course, had to help us down. Mm -hmm. Me and my brother, and my grandmother, and some of the other people, there were a couple of children, I know that, that came out with us. Uh, we thought that it was all quiet for, for a certain amount of time, but obviously there were still some looters that thought they might find something. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we heard voices. It was nighttime. We hit, there was another place in the pantry that was a root cellar that was the second hiding place. Mother took my brother and I quickly into the root cellar my grandmother was behind us, and she heard them very close, so she covered us with the cover, and she acted crazy. And when she was asked, anybody else here, she says, I don't know anything. I was laying there, I was half out, and I don't know much, and she acted crazy. They took her away. My mother heard her be taken away. We stayed until the next night, and we ventured out. Mother figured the best way to cross was across the river. I know, that I remember the name of the river, it was the Berezina, and it started, it was still pretty narrow at our place and not too deep, and we waded the river and were met by two guards. Mother knew them, they knew my mother. Everybody in town knew my mother. Mm -hmm. 
She had told them to put their rifles on their back. She, they knew that she had valuables. She said she'll give them whatever she has to let us run. Little did she figure that eventually they would tell on us anyway. Mm -hmm. She had a, a watch with a gold chain that she put into the hands of one of them and kind of wrapped it around his wrist so he, so he wouldn't lose it. And she gave some trinkets to the other guard. She told him to put out his hands so she can put the trinkets in. By the time it took them to dispose of those trinkets to put them away in the pockets, we were able to run. We ran to a village where we used to go at Christmas time to help decorate the Christmas trees. My father's best friend. He agreed to hide my brother and suggested that his sister, who had a daughter my age, that she would be able to hide me. My mother left my brother with him, and we went to his sister's house. She fed us, of course, and we got to clean up a little bit, and word came to her that they were beating up her brother. His mother-in-law told on him because she would get 10 kilo sugar for disposing it exposing a Jew. Mm -hmm. So she was willing to risk that. They beat up her son-in-law until he finally told them where my brother was hidden. However, he had enough sense to send his own son to his sister's house just to tell her that the Germans were trying to take my brother away, and they were beating up on, on his father. Needless to say, his sister packed us up very quickly and sent us off. She sent us to hide in a bathhouse. There was a stone bathhouse at the end of the village. The villagers did not, needless to say, have showers and bathtubs, <laughs> or two bathrooms, or one or more bathrooms in a house. And so they, on, Saturday, they went to clean up for church, and they would go to the bathhouse to take their baths. And we hid there overnight, and then we ventured off. The next place, we basically everything on foot. By night, we walked. During the day, we hid. Mm -hmm. And we got to the house of the woman that took care of my brother. She hid us and she went off in to town to find out where my brother was. Unfortunately, had we gone there first, I don't know, maybe my brother would have been alive because she wanted to see if she could get my brother. She had no children, and she would have raised him as her own. However, she found out that he was shot, and that was May 8, 1942. And he was six or seven years of age. No, he was four He's years four of years age. He's four years of age. Four years of age. Um, no, I'm sorry. He was, he was six, or, six seven. or seven years of age. He was and four when the picture was taken. Right. By the way, the picture you saw first, that's the only possession I have and the only memory I have of my brother mm -hmm. and the only possession I have from, from my home. So once your mom got this, and you, but your mom got this horrible news, what did you do then? Well, my mother decided that the safest place was to get to the larger ghetto. And so we went again to a farmer. We had many farmer friends, but everybody was afraid. Mm -hmm. They were afraid because anybody could expose them, and that meant death to their families and to us, of course. Uh, this particular woman was a widow whose husband had died a few years back, and my father basically helped her save the farm. He extended funds to her so she could continue on, and she hid us overnight. The next day was market day, and the farmers would take their, whatever produce they had to sell to the market. She loaded the wagon with the produce, and instead of herself and her son and daughter going to the marketplace, she dressed me in her daughter's clothes, my mother in her clothes, 
and the son drove the wagon, and we went to this larger city where there was a ghetto still with Jews. With the crowd, we managed to steal into the ghetto, and of course the son sold his produce and went back home. In the ghetto, it was the same arrangement. And you had, in this larger ghetto, you had to have documents because you could not even move around in the ghetto without documents. My mother was able to obtain documents for me and for herself. Mm -hmm. That's when I became born in 1930, even though I was two years younger. It also qualified was just, me. Was that just accidental or was that a deliberate decision? Uh, I don't really know. Uh, That's the document she was able to obtain. Okay. And it's of little consequence to me other than the fact that I was able to go out to, with the workforce. Because uh, you were two years old. Because older. I was old enough to do some work. Uh, all I can tell you is that if you couldn't get out to work, the next time they came to shrink the ghetto, you were one of the selected people. My work was, and that I remember, tying in, in a spinning mill, tying the, the wool threads that had broken. I had to be very quick. Unfortunately, I had nimble fingers. Mm -hmm. My mother was taken out as a laundress. So we had the ability to leave the ghetto with the workforce. With my mother's contacts during market days, she was able to connect with a friend of my father's who smuggled a, a gun into a basket of eggs to my mother. Supposedly he was selling her the eggs. Mm -hmm. And she had something to offer. She knew they were Russian prisoners of war that managed to escape the Germans who mistreated them badly and formed themselves into a resistance mm -hmm. to slow the progress of the Nazis to the front lines. And so she had something to offer. And one day, with the workforce going out to the assignments, we walked out with the farmers. To go to your the, jobs. To, we walked out to go to the jobs, but we walked out of the city with the farmers returning. Some of them would come by wagon and some of them would bring produce on foot. The ones that were villages closer would bring produce on foot. And so this is how we got out of the ghetto. So you're out of the ghetto. Your, your mother has taken you to sneak into the ghetto, and now you've, you've gotten Sn out of it. We snuck out. We had the clothing, the farm clothing, that we could blend into the farm population and could walk out. And your mom's objective now was to link up with those partisans. With the partisans. She actually had plans before, and they built a tunnel under the uh, barbed wire fencing. Somebody got word of it. Mm -hmm. some young man, and they used the tunnel before the time, and they were caught by the Germans. Mm -hmm. And so that route was closed to us. So, so from, she, from there, Ray, your mother and you make your way and to the partisans in the forest. And so in the, give us a sense of what that was like. It's hard to imagine. Here's your mother escaped out of the ghetto with a, a young child, going into the woods, finding a group of resistance fighters, the partisans, and joining up with them. First, how did, how did she even get welcomed into the resistance? Well, that was her idea. She had the gun. Mm. Uh, the Russian prisoners of war were marched, or that's what she told me, to the town. And even when some of the non -Jew well, the Jewish population couldn't, but the non-Jewish population would offer them water. They would hit them with the rifle butts and would not let them accept the water. Uh, they got so disgusted, of course, and saw that there was no 
no avenue of escape for them. They started to escape en masse. Mm -hmm. Some of them were shot, and some of them, of course, got away. Mm -hmm. uh, the area is surrounded by forests, uh, pine forests. Any of you have gone to cut your own Christmas trees? You have seen how low the pine, le the pine branches are? Well, that's how we could hide. Mm -hmm. I've slept many a night under those pine branches mm -hmm. and hopefully not a cone under my back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they escaped en masse and gathered in the forests. Uh, they had no guns to protect themselves or to do any harm to the progress of the Germans to the front lines. At first, they laid down their rifles and became prisoners of war, and then they had to fight their way to remain alive. Mm -hmm. And so, if they, they would try to catch some soldiers that were out on assignments. However, they did not shoot them, because then, you know, they would, they would get a force coming to fight them. So what they did was, is they would take away their rifles, take away their clothing. In the first place, they had some Nazi uniforms, the German uniforms, mm -hmm. so they could disguise themselves to do their work. And they would leave them in their underwear and tell them, tell them that the farmer caught you with his daughter, so he made you run, so they could save face. Mm. Mm. Uh, they had the rifles then, and they had some German clothing, so they could infiltrate, and they could also um, start fighting back. Uh, most of the work of the partisans was to disrupt the progress to the front lines, the German progress to the front lines to fight the Russians. The work was to dislodge, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the work was to dislodge the ties, the railroad ties, so the trains would derail. Needless to say, they could collect some ammunition from the trains and use that ammunition to blow up some of the roads. Mm -hmm. they, weren't, they were mostly cobblestone roads. There were some roads that were paved as the Germans progressed and they used the labor of the population. So this way they, they could slow the, uh, the lines to the front. So Ray, tell us what, what your mother and you were doing with the partisans. Well, basically, mother was cooking the soup, mostly potato soup. She was their cook. Mm -hmm. She was their cook. Mother didn't cook at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she learned, she was a good observant, mm -hmm. and she knew that if you fried onions, that they make the soup a little better, and so they loved the soup. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the farmers uh, had to uh, give the Germans a certain amount of their produce, and sometimes they would come and take their cattle, their cows, of course their horses mm -hmm. were all taken. and. Uh, they would, the farmers finally drove the uh, livestock into the for, further into the forest for grazing, and the partisans were the guards. So, and the Germans were afraid to go into the forest because they would encounter the resistance. Uh, as the front line started to move forward, uh, the Russian armies kind of joined up with some of the partisans, they didn't really join them, but what they did was is they supplied them with ammunition, basically grenades, because that would blow up railroad cars and uh, some ammunition for the guns. They would drop it, and the partisans really organized themselves as an army, and the Russians dropped some people uh, of rank that could manage them. Uh, they also set up a hospital, mm -hmm. and I wound up in one of them because I got sick with typhus. Mm -hmm. Mother managed to get me to that hospital because we were with a forward group. Uh, you, would, you would call it a reconnaissance group at the edge of the forest. 
And we wound up not with our group, but all the way in the back of the forest in the hospital. Uh, by the time the Russian armies were pushing the Germans out, they had a front line to, to consider and then the back line. The partisans were kind of surrounding them, so they started to fight the partisans and the partisans dispersed. Mm -hmm. uh, Mother and I were stuck, of course, in the hospital. I was well enough to walk. However, I, my head was bald. <laughs> it was shaved, my hair was shaved because the typhus was spread by lice and of course everybody tried not to have any hair, that's what they hid the most. You, you mentioned a little while ago that you slept many nights under p pine branches in the pine Oh, yes, when... But it, really the conditions were really tough. You were living in the woods, uh, food was meager, the weather was awful at times. It was a really very harsh environment for you. It, it was a very harsh environment, and but lice. the farmers, the farmers were mostly... Um, they were cognizant of the fact that the partisans were there. And to some degree, the partisans did not loot them. The partisans did not take away their grain that was next year's um, crop, basically. They could, they could sow the grain, uh, their seed, mm -hmm. and um, their animals were kind of preserved. So they were willing to supply some of the things to the partisans, basically foodstuffs. Um, but at times when, when the Germans came into the villages, and since we were a forward group, we were more exposed to them, uh, we had to hide, and then we would run into the forests. Food was scarce. Potatoes, uh, Belarus is known for its potatoes. And so potatoes were pretty, pretty uh, plentiful, and also root vegetables. And of course, there were mushrooms in the forest. I, rem I knew which mushrooms were good to eat and which were not. There were cranberries because there were marshes around the area. So even lived, though- lived off the land to a large extent. Ray, in, the the land. in the time that we have left, I want, there's some things I know you want to tell us. You were caught by the Germans as, with the partisans uh, and that was a, and then had a very narrow escape. Tell us about that. Uh, when the partisans dispersed and we were with no group, basically we were caught up with the farmers, with the population. And the population was taken out of the villages and brought, well, the closest place was our hometown and they put us in a warehouse. We were caught with the population. Uh, at one point, they started the, Nazis were famous for separating females from males, even children, female children from male children. And uh, there were no young, not too many young men because the young men were afraid. Either they were taken into the German armies or they basically had to join with the partisans. So they started to separate the females from the males, and I had no hair, and I was dressed like a boy, and I was being separated from my mother. I was sent with the boys. Since I knew Yiddish, which is a very similar language to German, they were debating whether I was a girl or a boy, because the features looked more like a girl, but the dress and no hair, prompted them to think I was a boy. And I said the only word that would get me back to my mother, which was, which was Mechen, which meant girl. And then some of them decided I may be Jewish because how would I know the word, the German word? Most of the farmers were very illiterate and did not pick up languages. Mm -hmm. Mother got word of it because she was hiding. She was in her hometown with a population that knew her very well, and she came out and approached the Germans and said that I was her daughter. They had gallows set up. They were famous for hanging people. 
They put me under the gallows and they said to her, we won't touch you, but tell us, is this a Jewish child? And my mother said, no, she is my daughter. She is not Jewish. She knew a few words of German because I was doing your laundry. And I am slow. I can't understand. I can't learn a language. But she's a child, and she learned a few words. And they decided if my mother offered herself to be hung first, and they did not recognize her as Jewish, then she's probably telling the truth, and she let, they let us go. So then you rejoined the partisans after that. Well, what happened was is that they sent the villagers back to their villages, and we had no village to go to. Mother gave them the name of a village. She knew the area very well of a way distant village so that we kind of had to pass and stop at many villages, different villages. We finally came to a place where some of the villagers couldn't go any further because of the front lines, and somebody recognized my mother. However, there was another woman that heard about it, and she did not have any ill feelings toward Jews, and she knew my mother for the type of person that she was, and she came over to her and she says, look, I recognized you a long time ago, mm -hmm. but I kept quiet. But there's a murmur that somebody said they think they recognized you and they know that you're Dina, mm -hmm. the fabric store owner. So I would suggest that you make yourself scarce. Mother took me and we ran again. And at that point, we were able to find some of the partisans. We ran basically toward the front lines because we knew that that's my mother. I didn't know anything. My mother knew that that's where probably the partisans would go, and that's to help the Russian armies. And so we did get with the partisans, and we're liberated by the Russians. And tell us about your liberation. Uh, after, well, when we were liberated, uh, we went to live in the bigger city where we were in the second ghetto uh, because we heard that some of the Jews uh, managed to escape that ghetto and gathered there. Mother went to our hometown to see who survived. You go to the place mm -hmm. where you come from if you're looking for someone. Mm -hmm. A neighbor gave her the photograph that you saw on the screen. She picked it up from the garbage. She told my mother she did not loot our house, and she invited her to her house, and she said, look at my house. I have nothing from your house. Mm -hmm. You were a good neighbor and a good friend. I picked up the picture as a memento of you, but I would suggest that you don't spend the night because I would love to have you as my guest, but both you and I would not survive the night. Mm -hmm. She gave my mother some bread and food and, of course, the photograph and mother came back to the bigger ghetto, basically again, walking. Mm -hmm. It was 30 kilometers, it was an easy walk. Um, we, I think we have time to turn to our audience to ask some questions. questions. Okay. Um, but before we do, I, I would like you to, if you would talk about, your, your mother was just an extraordinary woman well, in every mother, way. Mother was, well, she was smart, needless to say, but yeah. she was also very resourceful. Mm -hmm. And she could look ahead and see what, what to do next. Mm -hmm. She always planned, and I guess it was easy for her to plan ahead. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I guess all of us plan ahead. And Tell us about her at, at, the, at the end of the war. Uh, you were liberated in the summer of 44, but the war, of course, went on until May 1945. Correct. Um, your mother was able to get you on a train fixing water towers? <laughs> mother enlisted she, as a partisan. She enlisted in the Russian army. She enlisted in the Russian army as a worker. And uh, we, we got lodging in a boxcar and traveled with the train to fix water towers. We got as far as Prussia where conditions were awful. And she managed to get our train car attached to a train that was heading south to a city called Lublin. 
where there was, it was um, a big city, mm -hmm. and it was very close to one of the big concentration camps, and that's where the survivors gathered. Mm -hmm. We got, I'll make it very short mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. We got to that city, and they had uh, already some establishment with uh, the Jews in Palestine where they sent uh, groups to try to bring the Jews out of Poland into what was then called Palestine and now is Israel. And we uh, basically, I learned my geography on foot. We walked, rode, until we got to Italy. We, we were caught at one point, we thought we were in the Russian, in the American zone, we ended up in the British zone, they sent us back to the Russian zone, and eventually went through the Alp passes, the Alpinian passes, into Italy. The first city we went into was Padua, then Modena, and then we ended up in Santa Cesarea. The very end of the boot of Italy. The very end of the boot of Italy with the hope of crossing the Mediterranean into what was then Palestine being Israel. However, I'm sure all of you have heard or maybe the adults have heard about the exodus, the ship that was caught and the people taken off at Cyprus and became kind of imprisoned there. We missed that ship by this much. Mm -hmm. Uh, mother started to look for my aunt and uncle who emigrated to the United States and she had memorized the address. The only thing she forgot was the two letters after Washington. She wrote the letters to, to Washington, but to it Washington. was Washington State. Yep. <laughs> the letters came back. And of course, it had to be Washington, D.C., but you put an ad in a Jewish newspaper, and my uncle saw it and contacted us, uh, went and made out, asked for making out immigration papers. He had to promise to support us, provide lodging, food, clothing, medical, and education for me and deposit $5,000 in 1947, which was a fortune. Yeah. He mortgaged his store. He had a grocery store in order to supply the guarantee for us to come to the and United Ray, States. And Ray, we're gonna, we're gonna turn to our audience, but am, am I, is my memory correct that um, um, you, you couldn't get over here because the, uh, the Polish quota uh, for coming here was so so uh, restrictive, so you were able to end up getting on the Russian quota, which allowed you to get here. And the other thing I want to say is that because your identification papers had you two years than you really were, when you came here, you were you were officially 17 on record. You're really only 15, but you were 17. But they put you here in school in kindergarten or first grade. Elementary school. Elementary school at age 17, but you quickly made your way up. So let's, tur let's turn to our audience, and we will hear again from Ray to close our program, but we do have a couple of minutes for some questions. Um, I'm going to ask you to um, uh, make your question as brief as you can. We'll have mics in the aisle. Please wait till you have a microphone in your hand to ask the question. Keep it brief. I will repeat the question to be sure that everybody, including Ray, hears the question, and then she'll respond to it. And I'm going to turn first, if I can, to Kai here, because she's getting questions on the internet from people who are tweeting and on the internet. Kai, you have a question. Yes, good morning, Ray. Um, the question we have via Twitter is, while volunteering at the museum and sharing your story, can you tell us about your most memorable visitor that you've met? The, we tell, tell about can the most memorable visitor yeah, that you have met here at the museum, your most the memorable most visitor. Most memorable visitor. Uh, my most memorable visitor here at the museum was actually somebody who was from Belarus. Um, I was surprised because we have many visitors from many countries, South American countries, even as far as Australia, uh, New Zealand, from Africa, and here somebody shows up from Belarus 
And he says, how did you survive? <laughs> I said, well, there were some good ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Was he living here or was he actually a visitor? No, he was living here. He escaped too. He escaped too. Okay. All right. So let's see. Do we have anybody who has a question? And I'll try to spot you, but I'll, I, I'll ask the ushers to help well, me do that. Uh, actually, there was one more okay. that I want to mention. Okay. There was a gentleman, that was a while back, from um, Cambodia that was very much surprised that he saw the exhibit on Cambodia at the Holocaust Museum. And of course, I told him that we're concerned with all the atrocities that happen anywhere. This museum, sure, it commemorates the Holocaust because that was the most horrible, the biggest extermination of people mm -hmm. for no other reason but because the Nazis inst instilled so much hate mm -hmm. into the public against the Jews and against other segments of the population mm -hmm. that with their lies they were able to inflict so much unnecessary mm -hmm. pain and destruction of human life. And he was impressed with the fact that Cambodia, which had a much smaller atrocity, was commemorated here. Not only that, he took out his wallet, he became a member of the museum and gave a $100 no donation. He says, I'm sorry, I don't have any more right now to spare. And I thought, you know, for a moment there, Thank you. I forgot about it. Thank you for sharing that one. Um, we have a question right here. Hi. Um, hi, Ray. Um, thank you. Um, so impressed with your life and uh, the strength of your, your story and, and that of your mom. How, how, when you came back over here, how long um, did your mom survive? T tell us how long your mom survived. Is My the mother lived to the ripe old age of 99 and a half. Mm -hmm. She died of a massive stroke, and amazingly enough, she died on the same English date as my brother was shot. It was, it was amazing that she survived. The doctors couldn't understand how she was holding on. Mm -hmm. And yet, on the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, on the same date, I got word from the hospital that she had passed away. That was in 2006, wasn't it? 2006. 2006, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, and, and let me just mention, um, I should have mentioned this before, Ray, after she finishes um, in a moment, Ray will stay up here on the stage and we invite anybody who would like to ask her a question and didn't get a chance to do so or meet her or have your picture taken with her, absolutely feel free to come up on the stage afterwards. We welcome that. So let's take our last question here. Young man uh, in the middle. Thank you, Ray. So I have a question about the beginning of the war. Were you expecting like all the Nazis to invade? Were you, were you expecting there to be an invasion of Poland when you were young? Was your family expecting the Nazis to come in or the Russians? Uh, I wasn't expecting anything. When, when you are that age, all you're interested in is your friends, your studies, and even though conditions were bad in the ghetto, we still, my mother had always had a tutor for us and she encouraged me, even during hiding, she was very good at math and she used to, <laughs> Teach me math, with the potatoes. With the potatoes. <laughs> with the potatoes. Mm. And um, you don't expect anything like that. You don't anticipate, because if people would have anticipated. But the other thing is that we couldn't go anywhere without, without papers. My husband's family had papers to emigrate to the United States. He actually came here on a visa that was issued before, before the Nazis occupied Poland, but they just didn't get on a ship. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to come here if my mother couldn't have convinced the American Council 
that she really was born when it was Russia, mm -hmm. because she named him all the areas around it. And she was born before the First World War, and that was Russia. And we came here on a Russian quota. Otherwise, people had to wait years mm -hmm. in order to come to the United States. And it still took till 1947, two years after the war. Two years, figure. that's yep. right. We, are, we have a tradition at first person, and that is that our first person has the last word. And so before I turn back to Ray for her last word, I want to, um, one, thank everybody for being with us today. Remind you, we'll have a first person program each Wednesday and Thursday and uh, through the middle of August, I invite you to come back. Um, again, Ray will remain on the stage when she finishes, so absolutely please come on up. Um, and then I think, um, I think that's probably it. I'm gonna turn to Ray for her closing words. The only thing is that over the years when I have spoken about the Holocaust and kind of looked back at it, it, it was lies about segments of the population that instilled hate in others. I couldn't imagine why I was hated because I was Jewish. Uh, we lived a, a quiet life, observing the rules of the country, didn't do anybody any harm, and created so much hate against us. I was many times asked by students and by adults, don't you still hate the Nazis? I hate their idea of what they did to us, of what they instilled in people. Almost 11 million people lost their lives. About six million of them were Jews for no apparent reason because hate was instilled against them. Thank you, Ray. Thank you.